privilege, uh, it's a blessing to have the opportunity to uh, preach on Mother's Day. Um, When I was informed that I would be preaching on Mother's Day, I was a little bit, I'll be honest, I was excited, but I was a little intimidated. Uh, I'm only 21 years old, I'm not married, um, and it's just, you know, you, you grow up hearing Mother's Day sermons and stuff like that, and so um, I, I was a little intimidated, but I'm, I'm ultimately excited and I'm blessed. This is an awesome opportunity. Um, and when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about um, my mom and just like women in my life that I know are mothers. And whether you're a mother or whether you're a woman, uh, I, I started thinking about how hard it must be uh, to be a mom or to, or to be a, a woman in today's society. There, it's, it's really, really difficult I mean, um, oftentimes, there's just so much that, that you all do that sometimes goes unrecognized. Uh, in the homes, you guys are uh, the nurse and the doctor, you're the caregiver, the counselor, you're up before the kids get up, and you're, you go to sleep after they go to sleep, um, and, and you're doing it uh, while tired, yet you're ex- the world expects you to have this smile on your face and this sweet attitude about you and it just has to be hard. I remember my mom was a nurse growing up and she would work night shifts where she'd be gone all night but she would get home in the morning in time for me to wake up and she would help me get ready for school and she'd send me to school and then she would sleep during the day but then she would pick me up from school uh, and the whole time her attitude never changed. And so I I understand that being a mom or being Uh, A lady in today's society has to be hard. There's a lot of things that goes on that I have no idea about. I would never understand. But I I do understand that those things a lot of times go unnoticed. They're unappreciated. They're unrecognized. Um, And so uh, today I just want to thank you. If you're you're a mom or if you're you're a lady, just stand up. And I want us to congratulate you guys because you guys are awesome. So can we clap for them? (laughs) You guys do a lot. So... Genesis, come on, stand up, stand up. If you're, if you're a lady or a mom, it doesn't matter. You guys do so much more uh, than a lot of times people recognize. Um, and and it, it has to be tough. It has to be tough. Um, I know kids, as a kid, I never really understood everything my mom did for me. Um, now that I'm a little older, I still am starting to understand those things, but there's still things I don't understand uh, and I'm sure that us men, or whether we're husbands or not, I'm sure that, that we could always be doing better at appreciating all that you guys do. Um, and so I'm, re- I'm really thankful for that. Um, and again, I'm just excited to preach today uh, because it's an honor, it's a privilege. Um, and something that I'm, 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 I'm really convinced of, and we're going to look at it here in a second, um, is I'm convinced that God has designed the heart of a woman or the heart of a mother to be a direct reflection of his exact nature. Um, and what I mean by that is, is that, uh, not that, that God didn't make men in his image as well, but I think what's really cool about Mother's Day is that it's, it, it opens up a great opportunity, a great and unique opportunity to see the nature of God in a way that we may not always see it. Uh, it's a great opportunity to learn more about God and to understand God at a deeper level because I think that there is a direct correlation between the heart of a, of a woman and, and the nature and the heart of God and the heart of Jesus. And, and I think we can find that in Matthew uh, chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. We're going to go ahead and, and go to that. So if you have a Bible, get to, get to that spot because I want to look at this together and I want to read this story. It's a story of, um, uh, of, of a widow, and, and I'm sure we've heard it a lot, but I want to look at it together. And I really want to break down... I believe in this story to be five characteristics or five traits uh, of the heart of this mother and the the heart of this woman. And I think that they are directly related to the heart of Jesus. Um, And I don't think that I know that because we can see it. Uh, So in Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28, um, let's go ahead and get there. And I'm going to read it for us, and then we're going to go back and break it down and look at it together. Uh, in, In Matthew chapter 15... Starting in verse 21, it says this. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. 
But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost uh, sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Um, This is an awesome story because we see a a really cool dialogue between Jesus and this woman. Uh, I want to go back to verse 21. Um, immediately we see something, the thing that stands out to me is immediately we see uh, the heart of this woman. It says in verse 21, uh, as Jesus went to the district of Tyre and saw, and it said in verse 22, behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Uh, In that time, Canaanites and Jews didn't get along. In fact, um, Canaanites were despised by Jews. They were hated by Jews. They, they, they weren't supposed to mingle. They weren't supposed to socialize. They weren't supposed to talk. It just wasn't something that happened. But here, we see a Canaanite woman coming and crying to Jesus. Uh, so, so Jesus being a Jew, the custom then at that time would have said, no, you're not, you wouldn't want to go to a Jewish man and say anything to him. Uh, there either wouldn't be a dialogue or there would be some type of confrontation. Yet that didn't matter to her. That didn't matter to her. Uh, and, and then this is, the, this is the first thing that I noticed. When she says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Here we see in verse 21 and 22 that this woman, her heart is a heart of empathy. She is empathetic. And, and, and what that is is, is the ability to take someone else's suffering or someone else's sorrow or someone else's pain and not only feel bad for that person, but to literally feel for that person. She says, Lord, have mercy on me. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Her daughter's suffering was her suffering. Her pain was her pain. There was no separation between her daughter's suffering and herself. She took it upon herself, even though she was not demon-possessed, to feel the pain that her daughter felt. And and I honestly believe that that is a direct reflection of Jesus' heart. Uh, In in Romans chapter 12, verses 15, it says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. How could I or how could we mourn with somebody who's mourning if I wasn't actually sad about what the person mourning about was sad about? Jesus, when, he, when he's um, going to Jerusalem, he, he looks out and sees that they're lost people, that there's, there's these sheep without a shepherd, and it says he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them, and he felt, he felt for them. And not only that, when Lazarus is dead, I, I like that story and, and the story of Lazarus, uh, before he resurrects him, before he asks him to open the tomb, it says Jesus wept. Jesus was sad for the death of Lazarus, the same way that Lazarus' actual, physical, biological family was sad for his death. He felt empathetic for those people. It wasn't just, oh, I feel bad for you. It was, I feel for you. We see that in the Old Testament with God. When, Jesus, when God's people are suffering, when they're oppressed, when they're taken advantage of, it talks about how God, God hears those cries. And not only does he hear the cries, he comes and he takes action, which shows me he has empathy for his children. And so the the woman here in this story, it's a great example. She says, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David, for my daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. Her suffering was her suffering. And I think that's a characteristic we can all strive to have. I think if if we want to bring people to Jesus, we have to be empathetic. We have to put ourselves in people's lives. We have to put ourselves in people's shoes and then when they suffer, we suffer. Whether we're, we're doing it, we're feeling empathy for each other in Christ or for the lost. Uh, uh, the way we strengthen each other is it, and when we feel empathetic for each other. The way we relate to other people to where we can build trust with them, to where they would want to hear the gospel, is when we put ourselves in their shoes and, and we feel for them and we're empathetic for them. We have compassion on people. I think that's, that's a core 
trait of Jesus, and I think it's important if we want to share the gospel with people, is to be empathetic for others. Not just sympathetic, but empathetic, just like this woman in the story. Um, and then it continues on. Uh, in verse uh, 22, we see another characteristic of this, of this woman's heart. We see, she says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. And then, it, from that verse, it, it's really interesting. Uh, we see that she is discerning. She's able to identify the problem. I can't imagine how, how, how much trouble this daughter was going through. And I can't imagine what demon possession looked like, but I'm sure if they were in the household that there was a lot of problems in the household. There was a lot of trouble. There was a lot of chaos in the household. And I'm not a parent, but I do know it's easier to blame the person than the actual problem itself. The mother could have easily said, oh my goodness, if she would just leave or if she would just not be around or if she didn't, wasn't demon possessed, we wouldn't have this problem. She could have easily blamed the daughter and wished that the daughter wasn't around her so she didn't have to deal with the problems or the consequences of this demon possession. But instead, she says, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. She is discerning. She's discerned in her heart and in her mind that my daughter isn't the problem. The demon is the problem. She has a deep love for her daughter, and she's not going to let this problem get in the way or, or smear her love for that daughter. And again... I think this is directly reflective of the heart of Jesus, the heart of God, the nature of God. Think about it. God could have easily looked at us and said, if humans just didn't exist, I wouldn't have this problem. If they wouldn't keep messing up, I wouldn't have this problem. Why don't I just get rid of them? I'll just get rid of them all and I won't have to deal with this anymore. I won't have to experience sin being in my perfect world anymore. But instead... He sent us Jesus to cure our problem. See, God was so loving and so discerning that He knew, no, I made humans to be perfect, yet sin is the condition that has contaminated them. It has tainted them. It has made them flawed. It has made them, it has made them diseased. It has given them cancer. It's spread so far that the only way that this is fixed is if the, if the condition is removed. And so God was so loving that He sent a Son to fix our condition, to heal our condition, to take sin out of our lives so that God could, could experience a relationship with us and that we could experience a relationship with God that He once had and that we once had. And it's perfect. It's a perfect relationship. It's a perfect situation. Because now we can come to God with boldness. We can sit at His throne. We can pray to Him openly. We can praise Him all the time. And we can do it with confidence because we know that our sin has been forgiven. And so this woman, she understands that. She understands, my daughter's not the problem. This demon that's possessing her, that's tormenting her, that's ruining her, that's making her act this way, that's making her think this way, that's the problem. And she's discerned that. And I think that, that's a direct correlation between Jesus and the heart he has. I think that's super cool. Uh, and it continues uh, in verse 25. Um, in verse 25, it goes down and it says, uh, well, if you keep reading, it says, but he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, send her away, for she is crying out after us. See, even the disciples haven't discerned that the problem isn't the daughter. The problem is the demon. They don't understand that that, that, the, that this demon is the real problem here. They're, they're, just, they're just annoyed that this woman is, is interrupting their daily lives. And so again, I think that the heart of this woman is discerning. But then if you keep reading, it says in verse 20, uh, 24, He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And then here's the woman again. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. So at first he doesn't answer her. Then the disciples say, come and send her away. So right now it's looking as if she's not going to get her request. She's not going to, this is her only chance and it's, gonna, it's, it's slipping away. The disciples that Jesus is with all the time, they're saying, ah, get her out of here. He hasn't answered her yet. But she doesn't stop there. She comes and she falls before him on her knees and, and, and she asks for help. She says, she says, Lord, help me. And so I think, the characteristic of her heart that we see here is that she is helpful. This woman, this mother, is helpful. 
uh, she wasn't only able to discern and identify the problem, she was willing to seek an answer. She was willing to find the answer, the solution to the problem. And she did it because she's willing to take action. She came and she knelt before Jesus. She not only knew that the, that, that the demon was the problem, she was able to discern that Jesus was the answer. And once she understood that, she was willing to take the actions necessary. She was willing to go and do everything she could to make sure that that demon was, that was fixed, that, that, that this problem is fixed. She kneels before Jesus. Um, and uh, I think that's amazing because Jesus, we see that in Jesus at the cross. She humbled herself before Jesus the same way that Jesus humbled himself to the point of, on a cross, the point of death. I think that's amazing. Uh, she understood Jesus was the answer, and she was willing to take action to get that answer. Jesus understood that God is the answer, and he was willing to take on the cross so that we could have access to God. That is amazing. I think whether it's this mother, whether it's a woman, whoever it is, I think God has designed the heart of a woman to be helpful. And I think, I, I think we know that because in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, then the Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. And, and a lot of times we can read that verse and say, oh, this or that, this or that. But no, this is saying that the heart, the nature, in the DNA of, of a woman, of a mother, is the desire to help. And I think that's the same desire Jesus had. Why would Jesus be qualified to help? Well, one, because he wanted to. What other man do we know of that would want to go to a cross for people that were his enemies? No one. Jesus was the only one willing because Jesus had a desire to help. And not only did he have that desire, he was willing to take the action. And we see that with this woman here in the story. It says, but she came and knelt before him. That's, an, that's a verb. Kneeling is a verb. She was willing to get down and get dirty so that Jesus could hear her problem and he could fix it. And, and it's the same thing with Jesus. I think, uh, again, if we keep moving on, in verses 25 to 27, it says, But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Um, I think that's amazing because here we see that this woman is persistent. She wasn't going to take no for an answer. She wasn't going to take no for an answer. Um, her love for her daughter was too deep for no to be the answer in this situation. And she had faith that she was going to get a yes from Jesus. Um, even to the point to where she even makes her self-comparable to a household dog. She's willing to get the crumbs if she knows the crumbs are what can be the solution for this problem. That, 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 is, a, that is a persistent, relentless heart that I wish I had in my faith. I wish I had the relentlessness that this mom, this woman had. And, and, and it reminds me of my mom. I was adopted because my mom and my father couldn't have children and when I read this story and I see the relentlessness in this mother, I think of the relentlessness in my mother's life. Um, I, I don't know if anybody here has gone through adoption proce the process of adoption, but it is a crazy, crazy process. It's tiring. It's long. It's expensive. It's, it's, it's draining. I mean, I remember all of our, my brother, me, and my sister are five years apart. My sister, I remember I was about five years old when we adopted my sister, and I remember... Um, we, we get the baby, um, and we ha it was, I thought it was finalized. Uh, we had her for like two weeks. We had a party with the church. Uh, the neighbors came. We, we took her to church a couple times. I remember this very vividly. Uh, but what happened was the biological parents, due to legal, you know, all the legal stuff, were actually able to take the daughter back if they chose, and they chose to. Uh, so... My first sister was taken away, um, and right then and there, my parents had a decision. My mom had a decision whether she wanted to go through this or not, because my mom was prepared to love that daughter. She was prepared to love that child, and yet that daughter and that child was taken back into the, 
into the lives of the biological parents. And so my mom had a decision, yet my mom persisted that she wanted a daughter, that she wanted a child. She went through that whole process again just so she could have the daughter that is now my sister. I wouldn't have been able to experience a sister in my life. My, my brother wouldn't have been able to experience a sister in my life. My dad wouldn't have been able to experience the, the experience of having a daughter if, if my mom hadn't persisted, no, God wants us to have a daughter. Uh, so when I read this story, I see the persistence of a mother, and I see that it has to be ingrained in the heart of a woman, that God designed women to have a persistence about them, a relentlessness about them that is unmatched. And it's only seen in Jesus. And again, Jesus, I, I like when he's about to be crucified, it, it talks about how when he's traveling into Jerusalem, he sets his eyes, he, he sets his gaze in Jerusalem. He, he, everything around him, he, he's zoned in. He's in this zone, and he, and he knows what he has to do, yet he's persistent. He's relentless about doing it because he understands this is the answer. This is the solution. This is what happens. He knows this is the will of the Father, and the only way it gets done is if I say yes, is if I continue with this. And, and this mother in this story, this widow, knew the only way my daughter is, is, is going to stop being tormented by this demon is if I keep asking. I keep asking. It says in Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 10, it says, And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. This mom, this widow, this woman was, was willing to ask. And she was willing to do more than just ask. She was willing to, to, to knock. And she was willing to do more than knock. She was willing to seek. I think it's funny, um, sometimes I lose my keys, right? I lose my keys a lot. And um, sometimes I find them really quick. And other times I can't find them in five minutes and I'm kind of in my head like, man, I got, oh, can't, they're lost. But then I realized I didn't seek for those keys. I didn't seek after them. I didn't look in every little place. I didn't seek after them. This woman, this, this mom, she was seeking an answer. She was doing more than just asking. It wasn't like she knocked once and five seconds later said, oh, no one's home. I think, you know, I'm going to go somewhere else. She knew that the answer lied with Jesus. And so she was willing to seek because she was willing to find. She wanted, she wanted an answer. And, and, and we're going to see here that she receives that answer. It says uh, in verse, if you continue on in verse 28, then Jesus said to her, oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire, and her daughter was healed instantly. Um, here in verse 28, we see that the characteristic of this mother's heart, this woman's heart, is full of faith. This mom, this, this woman, had a heart full of faith. It was filled with faith. Uh, Jesus, I think there's only two times Jesus says, Oh, great is your faith. One, it was to the, 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 the centurion, the Roman centurion, I believe, and the other one was to this woman. Um, and, and we see that her faith is full and that it is great because she understands that Jesus is the answer. Um, it, she humble. It's a faith so great that she's willing to lower herself to the point of on her knees begging a Jewish man answers as a Canaanite woman. It's, again, it's the same faith that Jesus possessed when he humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. He was God made man, emptied himself of all deity, so he doesn't get to experience being God anymore. He's a man now, and now he has to experience death on a cross as crucifixion. Yet, he, he had faith that God was going to be on the other side. This woman, when she comes up, and I can imagine, when she first goes up to Jesus, she doesn't know what's going to happen, but she has faith that she's going to get an answer. She doesn't know what the process is going to look like, but she has faith that there's going to be an answer. I'm sure she had heard about Jesus before, and so she knew this is what I have to do for my daughter that I love to be healed. 
She wanted it so badly that nothing was going to stand in her way. And her faith was so great that she was willing to put all of her eggs in the basket of Jesus. She was willing to put all, the, she was going all in. She wasn't holding anything back. She wasn't going to anybody else. She wasn't turning to anything else. She was, she, it, she was making a one-time investment solely 100% on Jesus. And I think that's amazing. That's, a, that's the faith that Jesus had when he put his faith in God, when God wanted him to become a man, to experience life, to grow up, and then to live a perfect life and then to be crucified. I, I, I love this story um, because from this story we can see so many characteristics of not only the heart of this woman, but the heart of Jesus. We can learn so much from moms and from ladies all around the world because they're constantly pointing us to Jesus. Whether it's, it's a mother or it's a woman, they're pointing us to Jesus. Not only is she empathetic because she makes her daughter's pain her pain, but she's discerning because she understands my daughter's not the problem. Sin is the problem. This demon is the problem. Evil is the problem. It's the same understanding that Jesus had. And without that understanding, we wouldn't be here today. I wouldn't be able to be here. We wouldn't be able to sing together if Jesus didn't understand this. If God didn't understand. If, if, if God saw us as the problem and not sin, we'd be in a lot of pro- We'd be, oh my goodness. We would not be here. That daughter would have never been healed if, if her mother thought she was the problem and not the demon. Not only that, she was helpful. She had a desire to help, a desire to serve, a desire to take action. She was willing to get down on her knees and humble herself so that Jesus could understand what she really wanted. And, and that's the same thing as, as persistence because she was so persistent on getting an answer. She was willing to, to ask. She was willing to seek. She was willing to knock. And through that, she got an answer. She was relentless. It's the same relentlessness Jesus had when he put himself on the path to the cross. To be able to endure that had to have been because he had a relentless, persistent heart. He wasn't going to take no for an answer. I, I think of him in the garden when he's sweating blood and, he, and he's just thinking about it and, and, it's, and it's turning in his brain. I'm sure the word no came up a couple times, but I also know from studying and seeing Jesus in his life that Jesus' heart was telling him, don't listen to that. No is not an answer. Yes is the answer because God wants me to do this. I love God so much that I'm going to do this. That mom loved her daughter so much she was willing to be relentless. And not only that, she's full of faith because she's going to Jesus for the answer. She's not going for anybody else. She's not looking in the world. She's not trying to fix it herself. She's looking to Jesus for these answers. And it's the same thing that Jesus did when he understood God has the answers. I like how Jesus says in the book of John, everything that I say comes from the Father. Because he understood that God has the answers. He understood that God has the wisdom. He understood that God has the understanding. He understood that God is the one who's going to get me through this. She understood that Jesus was the one that's going to get her and her daughter through that. And it's the same thing today for us. We need to learn from this story. We need to learn from the mothers in our life. We need to learn from the women in our life. When we see these kind of stories, when we see the impact, the empathy, the discernment, when we see the helpfulness, the serving, the persistence, and the, and the faith from these stories and from these examples, we need to strive to have these characteristics. God made us in his image. And I believe that to be true about women. And so uh, on this day, on Mother's Day, again, I want to thank you all for everything you do. I want to thank you for your empathy. Your empathy. I want to thank you for your discernment. I want to thank you for your helpfulness, for how much you serve. I want to thank you for for how persistent and relentless you are for the ones you love. I want to thank you for how much faith you have and how that's an example for us today. Today, I, I want you all to feel encouraged. I want you to feel appreciated, valued, loved. I want you to feel all of those things, because I, I also understand that a lot of times you guys, or you ladies, don't experience that. And that's unfortunate. 
And for us guys in the room, us men in the room, let's step up. Let's live our life in gratitude for the women in our life, for the, for the mother figures in our life, for the influential women who have had such an impact on our life. Let's live a life of gratitude for them. Let's tell them how thankful we are for them. Let's thank God for them. Let's serve them. Let's, have, let's learn from them. We have to. If we don't, it just won't work. And let's do this, not just for the women in our life, and not just to become more like God, but let's do it for the lost. There's lost people out there. There's lost people who have never felt empathy in their life, because no one's felt empathetic for them. There's lost people in the world who don't know the love of God, because they haven't felt the love of God. They haven't experienced the love of God. And that's only done if we obtain the heart that Jesus had. I believe in this story we see the heart of Jesus. Uh, and again, just thank you for everything you do. Uh, we wouldn't be who we are, and this world wouldn't be what it is today if it wasn't for women, if it wasn't for mothers, if it wasn't for that unique, special, Christ-like heart that all of you were given by God when he created you. And I, I'm thankful for that. I really am. Um, and so t- we're about to sing, and we're... And, and, we're about, to, we're about to close out, but, but if you, if you want to pray with us, if there's a relationship in your life that you want to pray about, or if, or if maybe you see these characteristics and, and you're thinking, I want to have those characteristics. I want to share those, those, those characteristics, those traits that Jesus had, because it's going to make me a stronger Christian. It's going to make my faith stronger. It's going to help my walk with God. If, 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 if those are characteristics you struggle with, which I know some of those I struggle with, then pray with us. We want to pray together that God can put that on our heart, that God can give us those characteristics and so that he may be glorified. Because when we start living out our lives with the heart that Jesus had, that's when God's going to be glorified and that's what's most important. So pray with us as we sing uh, and as, as we pray to God. Thank you.